Assalamu alaikum everyone, peace be upon you all. Thank you to welcome me in your community. Thank you to be here tonight. Um, so my name is Ludwig Mohamed Zahed. I was born in Algeria in 1977. Then I left Algeria after the civil war in 95. I'm living in France since then. I did uh, studies in theology in Algeria and um, Islamic theology, of course. I did a PhD in psychology, social psychology, but sexual minorities uh, facing fascism, discrimination, infra-humanization, you're not as human as me. So that was like, what are the underlying mechanisms common to any kind of fascism? Why all fascism or extremisms or radicalism, as we call it nowadays, are, face, are targeting, scapegoating minorities, sexual, gender, religious, ethnic, and even in my country, it was linguistic minorities, like my grandmother was not able to speak uh, Berber, our native language, because of Pan-Arabism in the 70s and so on and so forth. And then my PhD in anthropology was about alternative inclusive Islamic identities. So how those people from those so-called minorities are more or less visible minorities when it's possible to be, because sometimes in my country I can have 10 years of jail uh, for, promo for promoting homosexuality, as they call it, just like in Russia. Um, so how those people, how do we build our identities uh, at the intersection of both those Islamic values and those sexual gender uh, constraints or uh, needs or whatever we want to call them. So we did a study, which is a theological study about um, homophobia and transphobia or within Islam or without any judgment. It was main, mainly an academic study, of course. It will be published, inshallah, soon in different languages, including English and Dutch by the Amsterdam University Press. So it's an academic study. It's not about judging what's happening, but going back to the texts. The Quran, as you know, uh, Islamic uh, theology tradition is based on the Quran uh, and uh, the prophetic tradition, the, uh, the tradition of the prophet, peace be upon him. So everything he is supposed, Muhammad والسلام, he is supposed to have said, everything he has, he is supposed to have done, or some scholars even include uh, what he has seen and uh, didn't say that it was wrong. So he was kind of indirectly accepting or validating that, that act of someone, someone else. That's the hadith, what happened, what has been said in Arabic. So it's a systematic and systemic study meaning that uh, we systemic uh, systematic theology is about taking all the texts that are uh, related directly or indirectly to this or that topic namely uh, what we call nowadays homosexuality trans identity lgbt plus identities systematic means to make a system something coherent out of it a representation that is able to be transmitted i hope tonight um, because what we hear, you know, about is the relationship between uh, Islam and homosexuality is very, very um, incoherent. Doesn't make sense to me. So um, I left Islam for seven years, a few years ago. I mean, 15 years ago, I came back to Islam because I said, I need spirituality. So why after the civil war, after all the homophobia and the violence in my family, did I let go such a huge part of myself? So it was like when I was a teenager, I lived only my, sex, uh, my, my spirituality at the madrasa in, uh, in Algeria, trying to cut my, my, one of my arms, like my, my homosexuality. Uh, and then I lived almost for seven years also, the same period of time, only my homosexuality. And I, I kind of forced myself because I was so dizzy and depressed and so on. I forced myself step by step to stop any spiritual practice like praying, fasting, reading Quran that was so important for me that I learned by heart so close to, to, to who I was at that time, who I am, thanks God nowadays, I forced myself very uh, strictly to say no, but you have to let go otherwise you're going to get crazy. And thanks God, later on, after seven years, I, I went to, through Buddhism and Christianism and I have found more or less the same homophobic, transphobic interpretations. It's nowhere in their texts. 
but still you find someone there in their community trying to twist the, 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 the text to make it fit his or her or their own uh, pre-stated uh, 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 representation about sexual and gender diversity. I wish that presentation to be as interactive as possible. So if you have any question about what I'm talking about at, at that moment, please ask me. Then we will have a brainstorming session of half an hour at the end per small group, four or five people maximum, because you got to be more interactive that way, about what did you understand and do you have any other input or question. So, and then each uh, group will have one delegate. Uh, they say like, Washington is the capital of democracy, so we're going to do it very democratically, I hope. So one person designated, and he or she, or they will come here to present to the entire group, so you will have the floor, you will have the power to express what your group think about those topics. Second point, this is not the truth. This is just a study, an academic study. And there's other academic studies uh, from Scott Kugel, for example, mo much thicker book, more detailed book. Uh, Scott Kugel, Dr. Scott Kugel, uh, Emory University in Atlanta, who did also a few years ago, 10 years ago, almost in 2010, I think. Uh, um, kind of the same study, but more in length and, and less systematic about, um, but more anthropological. You cannot do everything at the same time. So he chose another angle. So... This is only one study, so you're more than welcome, respectfully of course, to contradict and say, I do, I do not agree because of this and that, and argument, because we're going to learn also from you about what is your point of view. Okay, so first part about gender studies, introduction about gender studies applied to Islam. What does it mean? When it happened? Did it happen? And why some scholars, scholars, especially in North Africa and Middle East, felt, and also in the West afterwards, felt the need to apply that paradigm of gender studies, we're going to get through that a bit, into the um, uh, uh, field of uh, Islamic ethics. First, uh, main point about fascism that I told you about in the introduction, why did I choose that terminology? I could have chosen another one, you could choose another one. So why is it, for me, the source of any discrimination behind a facade of cultural, religious, and also the scientific facade? Second main point, the Qur'an and the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ. What the Qur'an does say or do not say, does not say about homosexuality, trans identity, LGBT plus identities. Third main point, because this is, for me, very, very important, culture. We're going to go back to that uh, later on, on one slide. Really. What does culture, the, the first Arab's culture, say about what in Christian uh, culture we used to call for centuries sodomy, uh, sex, same-sex love between men? Fourth main point, I don't think we're going to have the time to go there. But you will have it. It's a presentation. You can get it on, on by email very easily. Just write to yes, me to myself. <coughs> Double culture and pink washing, what we call commonly in, in social psychology, homo nationalism. Why more and more LGBT plus individuals and also organizations leaders are promoting racism, xenophobia, Islamophobia. We can use different terms, but they they are um, uh, clearly uh, promoting that without even hiding behind a political correct facade. Why is it happening now? Once again, I, I don't think we'll have time to talk about that, but you're more than welcome to also uh, give some inputs about that after the brainstorming session. And some bibliography and, and perspectives at the end. Okay, so gender studies apply to Islam. It started more or less, this is schematic, but more or less in the 80s. Uh, Scholars like Judith Butler um, recalled the, the notion from Michel Foucault, historian and philosopher, French, uh, late 20th century, about biopower. Some political parties, some regimes are trying to control their citizens' bodies. Why is it so? Why is it so important for a political leader to control the way you act, you behave, you have sexual relationships in your 
team space, in your uh, private space. So she said, Judith Butler, that we have to rethink this political impasse because that end, sorry, because it's like there's something that we're missing, that those guys are not missing, they know why they're doing it, but we still don't get it. Why are, is it so important for them to do it? And there's a, a, a famous uh, feminist, Simone de Beauvoir, I think, a French one, a French uh, intellectual who said that everything is political. Uh, the work, the, uh, the way we, you, you, you do the dish at home or not, who is doing it or not, who's doing the grocery, who's got the best salary or not, men, the difference between men and women, and also transgender and homosexual or LGBT plus individuals. So, yeah, since the 80s, we're trying to uh, implement that idea that everything is political, for some people at least, maybe it should be for us, within the field of Islam. What makes it hard, and this is what also Michel Foucault and Judith Butler puts forward, is that that fascism, that imposing a monolithic identity bundle, norm, hyper-normalization of identities, is not located in one center. There's not one institution deciding what's going to be normal and what's going to be abnormal. And this is in the West happening now in the Arab Muslim society, so-called Arab Muslim societies, since the 20th century, but in, in the West it's happening since the 19th century, according to Michel Foucault as a historian. So those centers are diffused, diffused within our society. It can be a church, a mosque, a university, a hospital. We're still deciding, especially for example for intersex people, they have uh, an issue, a teenager especially, because doctors are deciding when they are born, if they're going to be in their life, their entire life, this, um, uh, described or identified as male or female. Okay, so since then, new Islamic uh, theologies, reformers, uh, applied their progressive, inclusive ethics within the field of Islam. Inclusive, everybody's okay with inclusive, with that term. Inclusive means that you include everyone, that you're not ha having that prejudice that a part of the population is uh, has to be excluded from your community. Because in Islam, you know, Islam means peace in Arabic, but then they start, some people start saying, oh no, no, it's peace, but not for homosexual, not for Jewish, not for Christian people, not uh, everybody else uh, in hell but us. So it's not peace for everyone, it's not universal. So inclusive is very, very important. And like Wahhabism, commonly known as Salafism, most of the time, but it's historically and politically, it's located uh, coming from Middle East, 70s, 80s. And Tekfirism, that's what we call Tekfirism in, in Arabic, but we commonly uh, know it as Jihadism nowadays. But this is not Jihad for me, of course not. This is not Islam. Takfir in Arabic comes from kafara, someone who is hiding the truth. People generally uh, understand it as someone who is not believing, believing in Islam or in Allah. I don't think so. I think that we have to go back to the etymological roots of that term. And kafara means someone who is hiding the truth for political um, assets or whatsoever. So that's, from my point of view, what those people are doing. We have to keep that in mind. We had the same problem early in the history of, of Arab Muslim societies, just after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. We had people trying to kill the Khalifs, and they did actually the successors of the Prophet, Khalif, Caliphs. And then it was Shiism with an S, uh, a lot of uh, sects appeared, and so on and so forth, because we had already, just after, right after the death of the Prophet, according to historians, a crisis of leadership within Islam. So this is, that's what I mean, this is not new. Unfortunately, to have to fight back extremism, radicalism, uh, fascism, whatever you want to call it, this is also part of our duty as Muslims from the very beginning. So, first, uh, 
Uh, okay, uh, I've, I've gone very fast, sorry. So, Ziba bin Hussein, a sociologist teaching in London, does recall the necessary distinction between Sharia and Fiqh. So, Sharia in Arabic, anybody who speaks Arabic knows, knows that, knows that uh, a Sharia is an avenue, a path towards elimination, Jannah, Paradise, whatever we, we call it in different cultures. It means that you have to move forward to learn to do mistakes and to learn again, you know? So that's not a box where you put your side on, on the sidewalk and, and stop, you know, evolving, adapting, some, stop uh, being smart. This is not what I would call Sharia. But, you know, now when we, call, when we talk about Sharia, it's like, you know, the Islamic law. For me, it's not a law. It's just a philosophy of life. Fiqh comes from Faqaha in Arabic, which means basically understanding. It has something to do with understanding, teaching, transmitting, and so on and so forth. So Faqih is someone who knows. Someone who knows who, who is a teacher, basically. A teacher of Islamic studies, uh, uh, theology. So that distinction has been made from the very first Muslims also. But it has been put down on, on paper, in, in scholar books and so on, a few hundred years, a few decades, a few hundred years after the death of the Prophet, these people. So it's not that new. The fiqh, the Islamic fiqh and the big imams, you know, especially in Sunni Islam, we have big imams that uh, in North Africa we follow, um, they follow. And, uh, those imams came more than 100 and 150 years after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So how did they do before that? The transmission was, it was an oral culture. So I heard that someone <coughs> said that you should do this or that. But then they said, oh, there's too much diversity. People are contradicting one another. There's, we already have so much conflict. So I imagine that they decided to put that on paper but you know, it happened more or less like Freud says in Totem and Taboo, one of his book. Uh, um, every, almost every civilization, every community um, has had that period after 300 years, more or less, of existence, they start putting down the law. Like Amurabi did it in Mesopotamia, like, like the Jewish people did it with the Torah, like the Christian people did it with the Council of Nice and the Bible and so on. Like the Muslims did it also 300 years more or less after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So it's kind of a cycle, and anthropologists and uh, uh, psychologists, historians, do still do not explain how is it working like this, but once again, this is my, my ID. It's not only related to Islam or to the so-called Arab culture, okay? But what is important is that that Sharia, once again, has to be absolutely dynamic and contextualized. Context is very context. It comes with the text. It's impossible to understand the Quran if you don't know anything about the context, you know? And it's impossible. And that's uh, Kesia Ali from Boston University who says that in her book uh, about uh, sexual ethics in the Quran, great book, she recalls the fact that you could not respect and apply and live by the Islamic ethic if you do not apply it to your context, if you're just trying to mimic what was happening 1,400 years ago then you just betray the ethic by worshipping the some part of the tradition. You know what I mean? So it becomes a new god. Like the law, as you imagine it, becomes the god. You have to worship that law because it's so important for you to follow that law. Instead of following the teachings coming from God, inspiring through to our community, through the prophet, peace be upon him. So context is so important. And we tend to forget it in Islam. In, in Muslim communities. So that lead, leads us to summarize this paragraph to the difference between Islam with a capital I, referring to the Arab Muslim, so called Arab Muslim civilization, one of the biggest uh, empire, uh, Islamic empire, was the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish, you know, Arab. And Islam with a minuscule I here, referring to 
the philosophy of life as I understand it personally, but that's my personal point of view. But that's clear that, at least in French, you, you have some scholars like Hudson, wrote a book about Islamic aids and so on, brilliant, brilliant analysis, full of references and so on. But, but you don't have that distinction in, in English between Islam and Islam. But we do it in French, which makes it scholarly easier. People, if they know, they understand that, yes, there's a difference between culture and religion. And for me, as an anthropologist, as also a theologian working on liberation of minorities, I do consider for sure, and there's so many studies going out with all that's happening nowadays, that religion is a product of culture and not the other, other way around. We're going to go back to that later. So let's have a deeper look into the factual relationships between Islam, homosexuality, trans identity, LGBT plus uh, identities. You know, everybody knows that acronym, LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, queer, intersexual, asexual, all the way to Z if you want. 